Okay, now we're recording. So the first thing, right, you want to do is pick a document. And there were some questions over the length of the documents and uh, which one do we pick? Um, do we do the whole thing? No, you only do one document. So you, if you're going to do, say, this one, Indians of the Rio Grande, you're only doing the these three pages. Okay, once it stops, that's the end of that document. You go on and you can do, if you want, you can do this one, right? But there are several documents in each PDF and you only pick one, okay? Also, this information up here can give you some background and you can use that if you want in the prior knowledge, as well as anything you learned from the lecture or the textbook, okay? Now, if you're paraphrasing or you're using direct quotes, remember you have to cite that, okay? Um, your source is right here, and uh, this should be Chicago Manual Style, so you can actually just copy and paste that one, right? Although it's a PDF, I don't think you can do that. But this is source. Yes, question? Yes, so I noticed that there are some questions under some documents. Do we mm -hmm. ask those questions, or we just do what you ask us to do? I, just do what I asked you to do. You do not have to do the questions. Okay, thank you. And what she's talking about, like these here, you do not yeah. have to answer those. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yes, all you have to do is the two to three page essay, analyzing the document with the guide that I gave you. Um, there were some questions about length. It's a minimum of two pages, but um, you can take as long as you need. So if you're going to pay four, five, six, that's fine, although I don't think we should go much further than six, right? And I'm talking about pages of writing, not including the title page and the bibliography. So you want a minute on two pages of the actual essay of writing. And then, you know, you can, you need to add the bibliography page and you can add the title page if you, okay? You do not have to answer these questions. You only need to answer the guide questions. Okay, there was questions about which one can we not do? And the one that I did in the YouTube video was the Freethorn letter, which is the first document here. Uh, Freethorn letter, Virginia 1623. This is the only one that's out of bounds. Okay, and it's only because I did all the analysis already. So don't use the Freethorn letter, but you can use any of the other documents in those three PDFs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So then let's go to um, guide and what we're talking about here. So I went over a lot in the video, but we'll just kind of summarize that here. Also, this is pretty straightforward. Um, place and time, also pretty straightforward. Prior knowledge, if you did research outside of uh, the text and lectures, etc., you just need to make sure that you cite that source. Either if it's a paraphrase and direct quote, you need to put in a footnote and then put it on the bibliography page. Or if it's just in general, just make sure the source is on the bibliography page, okay? Audience um, is important. I did have some questions about that. It depends on the document, right, who the intended audience is. So if it's government document, the intended audience is not just the government and the monarchy, but also the general public because laws are made public, okay? And so if you're doing like Virginia statutes, um, the Mayflower Compact, right? Um, now the Mayflower Compact was originally um, a document just between the people on the Mayflower, but it also had legal standings. So it was um, like a contract. You could treat it like a contract or a government document in that sense. Um, but things like Christopher Columbus's journal, that's a diary, okay? So he doesn't intend for anyone to read it. He's mostly making notes for himself so that when he goes back to Spain, he can, you know, pull out his notes and explain kind of what he saw, what was happening. Um, and the example I used in the video, the Freethorn letter, right, that's a letter to his parents. He does not intend anyone else to read it. He intends for just his parents to read it. Okay, and so when you're looking at reason, it's important that you understand who the intended audience is. For example, the letter, you know, he wants something. 
for Christopher Columbus, the reason he's writing it down is for his own information so that he will have notes so that he documents what he saw. OK. Um, and then when we're talking about significance. This is kind of uh, one of those. Why are we looking at this document and how is it important today? Um, so just to kind of let you know, right, none of these documents were ever written with you all in mind. <laughs> Nobody intended for a history class in 2020 to be reading their journal. So it isn't about you. Um, the significance is more of we can, for example, if we do Christopher Columbus's journal, um, that gives us an idea of what the Caribbean looked like before Europeans got there. And we can then look and compare um, with how it looked 100 years later or even 200 years later and figure out that you know the Europeans decimated the Native American population, right? Those types of things happen. Um, Mayflower compacts, right? That's the first form of self-government in Massachusetts. Um, and they took that upon themselves. So that's an interesting um, document in and of itself. Statutes. Um, you look at what the statutes are saying, and that can kind of give you some significance, especially if they're describing um, early versions of laws. So you can talk about how the colonies are uh, making their own laws and attempting to provide order, right, with their own laws. So does anybody have any questions over the guide? Madeline Lewis. Okay, so what is the bibliography? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the bibliography page? Yeah. The bibliography page is the last page where you put all your sources. Oh, so okay. that's, yeah, that's where you put your citations. Uh, anybody else? Hold on. I have a question. Yes. Do we include footnotes in the Chicago style? Yes, if you need them. Okay. So. Thank you. Is this Jillian? No, this is Rania. Okay, I'm sorry, Rania. Um, yes, and I'm about to go over that when we open up the guide, and I'll show you the difference and how you use them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Jillian Hill. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the footnotes too. So, is there? So we don't have to use footnotes if we don't want to. Just we only use it if we want to cite a source. Um, you only use footnotes if you need to, and, I, and I'll go over when you would need to, okay? Okay. Uh, Jillian? You answer my question. Okay, okay. All right. So, Madeline, did you have another question? Yeah, so this is due tomorrow at 11.59, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And also, don't our um, other assignment open up tomorrow since it's Friday or no? Yes. Okay. Yes. It'll be open tomorrow and Saturday. Okay. So let me get out of that real quick and we'll open up this. Here we go. Okay. So in this guide, you're going to see something called note and then BIB. That's for bibliography. So the difference between the two, as you can see, is basically a page number. Um, and so the note describes how you would put that citation in your note. Okay, It's talking about a footnote. And um, the, the BIB is how you put it on your bibliography page. Now, when do you need to use a footnote? You need to use a footnote if you are paraphrasing a source or if you are quoting directly. And the footnote should tell the reader exactly where to find that information, exactly where to find that quote. OK, so it's um, it's not required, right, unless you're paraphrasing or quoting. If you paraphrase or quote another source and don't cite it, that's plagiarism. OK, so just make sure that you um, read over your paper. If there's anything in there that you're even a little unsure about, add a footnote. OK, and I'll show you how to do that real quick. Uh, so that's what those different things are titled. So you have like these are books 
Now, let's say you most likely use uh, here's oops, sorry. <laughs> here's government documents. Um, more books, encyclopedia. There's a newspaper article, magazine article, scholarly journal. If you use that, if you use a film of any sort, right, which you can. Um, website, right? If you don't necessarily know, you know, who's producing the website, hopefully you do, because if you're going to use it as a source, right? This is how you would put it in the footnote, and this is how you would put it in the bibliography. Um, don't worry about this short form citations later. Um, that's a little advanced for what we're talking about right now. Um, and then it goes into if you're going to use an image, which I doubt y'all are going to use. So this is just a quick guide about how to cite your sources, how to put them on the bibliography, bibliography page, and how to put them in footnotes. So let me open up um, an example and show you what a footnote looks like and how to put it in. Again, this is... Uh, we're assuming you're using Word, but I'm pretty sure other, um, there we go. Okay, so let's do this so we can see it in, is that the software? So, right, this is uh, the first page of a, uh, a long paper. And as you move through here, what the? Mm. Okay. Let's try. Uh oh, there we go. So you can see here that they these are the notes. Let me. Sorry. That might be a little bit better. Um, so footnotes are at the bottom of the page. So they're here. Okay. And the difference between a footnote and an endnote. A footnote is at the bottom of every page. An endnote is at the back of the chapter, at the end of the paper. Okay. But you're going to be using footnotes. Now, um, a footnote looks like this here. It gives you a small number. All right. So at the end of that, I inserted a footnote. It's number five. It immediately drops me down here, and I put on there what the footnote was for. So let me go back because those are okay. So here you can see um, a longer footnote um, from this, uh, uh, and here you go. This is one footnote here, and here's the um, place where the author can find that information, and that is right here, right? So we added that footnote. And you come down here, and that's where you can find it. Now, how do you add a footnote? Um, okay. uh, let's close that out. There we go. Okay. Let's say, you know, you're writing, and you're at the point in your paper, right? I'll just put the... Um, can y'all see that? Let me... Okay, so let's say, right, you want to insert a footnote right there where the, um, right here, right, where the cursor is. Go over to references, right, and insert footnote. Boom. It automatically puts the number in there and drops your cursor the information. Okay. So that is where you, how you put in a footnote. Okay. Do you all have any questions revolving around footnotes or anything of that nature? Any questions over the analysis at all? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, all right, so no questions on this, then I'll close that out and um, talk about the document analysis. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, is we're going to, I'm pretty sure, let me get out of here real quick, hold on, let me take this off, that uh, we covered all of chapter five with that PowerPoint. Um, I'll go back and double check, but um, yes, Ms. Williams, or Mr. Williams. Um, what font do we use and how big you want it and what's the spacing? Yeah, double spaced, mm -hmm. 12 point times New Roman. Okay, yes ma'am. Okay. Um, any other questions, concerns? Um, I have a question. So, yes. It's due tomorrow at 11.59, but on Blackboard it says 10.59. So which one? Um, let's see. How, where do you see that? <laughs> like when, um, hold on, let me just do it really quick so I can tell you how. So you go to assignments and then you click document analyst. Mm -hmm. These complete, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it says 1059. All right, let me check real quick. Uh, I look on the. Are you in the right time zone? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Start day in the sure right. All right, fixed it. So there you go. Thank you. Yep, and I need to let me make a note. I need to check that on all of them. Um. They had to redo the link apparently because the link wasn't working. So I don't know if it got changed when Blackboard did it because I always make it 1159. But I'll double check. I'll double check them all and I've already fixed yours. Um, so y'all. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Um, did you say the font was uh, Times New Roman? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I'm pulling up the PowerPoint now. Now, memory serves, we were at the very last one, right? Uh, we talked about committees of observation and, uh, sorry, let me put that down so I can share it. Right, we talked about this one. I don't think so. Okay. Did we cover committees of observation? Yes. Okay. So I think we are on this last one and we'll start there and then we'll um do some other things. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Let me do this real quick and then um, change how we're sharing here. Come on. Oh. There. Okay. Um, so what, 
well, this is the end of the chapter. And we've already uh, covered, right, the First Continental Congress. They don't actually name it that at the time. Um, come on. Show this. Off. There we go. Okay. Um, they, let me get this in here. They just use this as kind of a general meeting amongst the other committees. And again, one of the effects of the French and Indian War is that you have all 13 colonies talking amongst each other. Okay. And this didn't happen before the French and Indian War. They kind of looked at each other as like their own individual nations. And then once they had to come together for the common defense of the French and Indian War, um, they start having these committees. And they're basically like glorified pen pals, right, uh, where they talk and they um, discuss what's happening in the politics of their region and the politics of their area. And so this is really important because, A, uh, it's communication and knowledge, right, and knowledge is power. Um, but committees encourage each other, um, and there is large spy rings set up, which will be utilized in the American Revolution. They stick to the boycott. And again, we talked about different regions have different reasons for sticking to the boycott, right? The South, because it's easier, it's cheaper for them. Uh, the North, because um, they are the ones that are impacted the most by these right the back country just because they see this as oppression and excuse me want to get rid of this so provincial conventions um, are meetings within the colonies by their leaders and their representatives so each one of these will send delegates to those meetings to the first and second continental congress to the constitutional convention which it's constitution day to day today is the um, anniversary of them signing the Constitution in 87, in uh, approving the Constitution, 1787. So, um, but this is the beginning, right? Um, we're about 20 years away from that, or 10 years away from that. Uh, and these committees are integral because the British government is going to try and divide the colonies. They want to deal with them individually because, of course, you divide and conquer, right? Um, so, you have uh, widespread communication throughout the 13 colonies, and this is a detriment to the British crown, right? This is not something that they had seen before. In addition to that, American colonists or English colonists in these 13 colonies in North America are literate. They can read and write. There's a lot of press out there, uh, former newspapers. And there's a lot of propaganda, which we'll talk about next. But there is a lot more communication in the written word going on in the colonies than is really in uh, the home country, right, in the British Isles. So this kind of leads into that. Um, by 1775, local independence is achieved, if fact, if not in name. And this kind of goes back to the fact that the British were never able to control the countryside. They can control the cities to a certain extent, but they can never they're in control the back country and um, the small villages and the farms, etc. They really are kind of stuck in the cities, which they will find is a problem in the American Revolution. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the PowerPoint for Chapter 5. We're going to go on and talk about um, propaganda and how that... Um, moves us towards the road for independence and into chapter six. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. So let me stop that. We'll close that up. Okay. And I'm going to pull up the YouTube. Actually, I'm going to pull up a couple documents too. Um, to show you. All right, so when we're talking about propaganda. Um, most of this is happening in the written word or in these newspapers. And the first one I'm going to pull up here and show it to you. Hi. Um, Paul Revere. Let me pull it over here. Here and then actually pull it 
that one here. Let me put the picture over here. Oops. Okay, hold on. And I'll put it over on your screen. There. Okay, so now this is an engraving, and you can even see down in here it says engraved, printed, and sold by Paul Revere in Boston. And this is um, <clears throat> a picture that comes out about the Boston Massacre, right? So you can see here um, what's being portrayed. And the reason I brought this up is because there were questions about symbols on the parts guide. And you only have to worry about symbols when you're talking about a picture, i.e. a political cartoon, a piece of art, or something like this. Okay, and this was printed and reprinted all up and down the 13 colonies. But you can see that there's right some propaganda going on here. So you have, you don't see any clubs, any weapons of any kind over here in the Bostonians, right? Um, they all are portrayed as completely innocent. And then you have the British who are seen, right? here's your commander, seeming to order them to fire, uh, which did not happen. Right. And you see them standing up and shooting. And then, of course, you know, right. He gets hit in the head. I'm assuming this is supposed to be Christmas addicts. Um, right. And so you have. This picture here that. Shows and otherwise, as you can see, empty street, peaceful people being murdered. OK, so this is where you kind of start getting the name the Boston Massacre come out. And it's portrayed as a massacre, obviously, right, by this picture. And a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Um, and today, we're even swayed by memes and um, pictures today. If you look at social media, right, everybody's worried about their picture, not necessarily who they are, right, um, or what they put on there. So these are really important. And you see this is used by patriots as propaganda, right? To cut, try and sway people to their side of the cause. But then you pull up, for example, um, let me get into your mind tap because your book has a political cartoon there of the British, their version of things. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, we'll go into the book. Oh, there we go, sorry, it's a big part. Try and open this up. All right, well, there you go. Join or die. Um, and this part of the colonists' propaganda. But Benjamin Franklin published this cartoon. And then they, this, again, is the picture under the Getting Started folder on, on your uh, blackboard. But um, his newspaper, right? He owns the Pennsylvania Gazette. It's 1754. And it's pictures of snake right cut into pieces and each piece is a colony and so um he said this is a way of saying you have to join together right or die. join or die pretty easy pretty simple but this is trying to get um provinces who are or colonies who are more reluctant to go against the british crown um to come together because he knows that you know, especially in the French Indian War, but even later on, <clears throat> if the British are capable of dividing them, they have no chance of winning. Right? Okay, so we are going through things. No, that's a picture newspaper, but not what we're looking for. Hmm. 
I have a question. Yes. So you said you were going to open up those um, past chapter tips. Was that today? No, that's on October 3rd. Oh, okay, October 3rd. Thank you. <laughs> Must have been here. All right, so there's the picture, right, that I just showed you. More color. Oh, where's that political cartoon? Got to be in here. Uh, I just looked at it <laughs> right before class. Uh, but of course, we can't find it. Okay, here we go. This is what I was looking for. We'll see if we can't uh, view this larger. Come on, mind it. Oh, you can't see the whole picture. All right, let me make it a little bit smaller. Okay. So, um, this is from the British side. It says, uh, a new method of macaroni making as practiced at Boston. So this is found in the Library of Congress prints and photographs um, from a British newspaper. And so what they're portraying is that these Bostonians here with their happy faces are uh, vicious, violent, evil doers, right? Uh, and you can see like this man has been fought, tarred and feathered. Um, obviously, his face would not look like that. It would be in agonizing pain. But this is the punishment that these people have inflicted on him. It also kind of shows that these two people are in aristocratic uh, clothing. These are not workmen. You don't see workmen walking around with tights on. Um, so they are somewhat aristocratic. And that here he's holding the tar. He's poured it over there. And they feathered him. And this was a common... Um, way to influence or uh, impress upon tax collectors that they did not want uh, to pay those taxes. And if they were caught collecting them, patriots would do this. Is this accurate? Yes, this did happen. Um, does it happen like, you know, you see the glee on their faces there? No, and it does not happen very often. Okay, but there was a couple of instances in which tax collectors or port authority who were going to collect taxes on import exports were uh, grabbed and tarred and feathered. Okay. And if you know anything kind of about that punishment, um, you can't wash tar off, right? It burns and sticks to your skin. In order to melt the tar, it has to be incredibly hot, right? Um, just ask anybody who's worked on a ro on a road crew. So it is incredibly painful, and most of the victims die. All right. So this is an example of propaganda in Great Britain. Professor. Alex yes, Alexis. Um. So if it's if the tar is on you, like what what do you do? Like you have to die or something? You don't have to die. Um. They try to get like the feathers off and kind of the out. Um, the outer parts of the tar off, but basically you just have to wait until that skin falls off. What? Will the skin grow yeah. back though? Yeah. Oh yeah. So you know your skin has several layers, but um, yeah. you know when you burn yourself, think about when you get a sunburn. If you get a sunburn, um, mm -hmm. your your skin peels, right? If you get a bad sunburn, you blister. If you burn yourself on you know hot grease or you burn yourself cooking or whatnot um you're talking about degrees of you know third degree second degree first degree burns um, and your skin will heal and your skin will um, rebuild itself but it depends on you know how much of the body is burned and how much of the body they covered with the tar and feathering so something like this yeah if you look at this man here this man's probably gonna die right because 90 percent of his body is covered um, only his head and his hands are not. 
but this is not actually, you know, this this is a cartoon. Um, when the tar and featherings did occur, um, there was usually a mob mentality going on. He had been taken by force, and um, they poured tar over him. But he's obviously not going to sit still for this. People are having to hold him down. So it usually doesn't cover all of his body. Um, but either way, it's a terribly violent and painful punishment, especially for someone who's just doing their job. Yes, right. since um, that used to happen back in the day, is can you still access tar like that now, or like do they have it like locked up, or can you still access tar? Yeah, probably, um, because they use you know they use tars to repair uh, roofs and they use tar and asphalt. So um, yes, you can still access tar. I'm assuming you could get it at a, at a hardware store. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because um, that's how you, like if your roof is missing shingles, uh, you melt some tar, go up there, paint the little tar on, stick your shingle on. Hopefully you put a nail in it too, but yeah, we, we still use tar. And um, during the, this is not just reserved for, you know, before the revolution. You do see instances of tar and feathering going on in the South as punishment. Um, and uh, to people, for example, people who are uh, part of the Underground Railroad who've been caught um, and other instances. So it's not a common occurrence after, say, the American Revolution, but it does happen. And it is used in lynching as well. But it's it's awful. I mean, and, that, and that's the thing, like when we look back at the American Revolution, um, it is not clean. You know, it's violent. It's um, our, our founding fathers were not opposed to using methods like this. Um, and so it takes them down a notch. You know, it, it's for a long time, historians and um, society has put these. And they're human beings. They are not perfect and they don't belong on the pedestal. So when we you know, talk about these violent up, you know, upheavals and what's going on, uh, it's you know, that's the truth. Uh, and history is the good, bad, and the ugly, not just what you want it to be. That's the difference between history and, quote, heritage, right? Um, so this was what the British were kicking in on. So you started to see fervor within Britain against Bostonians and against the colonies as being barbarous and backwards and violent and overly violent, right? You're not gonna see any pictures in a British newspaper of the Boston Massacre, right? Um, and this is the effort of propaganda. This is what propaganda is about. Yes, Frederick, uh, Kale, Kaylee, sorry. Okay, sorry, I know we talked about this already, but when you go on Blackboard and it says like primary sources for document analyst one, and it mm -hmm. has like the one and three, the one and three and the two and four, the two mm -hmm. and four is the Freethorn letter and that's the one you did, right? So we choose out of the one and three, the other, the other first two, right? You can choose out of any of them. The Freethorn letter is just the first document in two and four. Okay. So if you click on two and four and you just move past the Freethorn letter, and use the documents after that on two and four. Okay, so out of those three little PDF files, I can choose any one. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions about that while we move over? Okay, and I've also uploaded, um, let me get off, sorry, let me move back over here and get off of this onto YouTube. Uh, a little video about Paul Revere. No, okay, there we go. All right, let's get on to that. Okay, um, here we go. So let me play this. Hopefully you can hear it. Let me turn up the... There is a huge fundraising deadline coming up uh -oh. for Senate Democrats, and they need your help right now if they're going to meet it. I'm asking you to please don't...
1775, Paul Revere rode his horse to Lexington to warn the Minutemen that the British were coming. Paul Revere was a great example of an ordinary man who became politically involved and who becomes symbolic of the American Revolution as someone who risked everything to make history and to change the world. Paul Revere was born on New Year's Day, 1735, in Boston, Massachusetts. He was an artisan, and that's a very important class in the 18th century. By 1760, Paul Revere was a master silversmith and sold his wares throughout Boston because he was a guy who knew everybody in Boston. Revere married Sarah Orne in 1757, and after her death, Rachel Walker in 1773. In total, he had 16 children. British soldiers invaded Boston in 1768. One of Paul Revere's first known political acts was to do an engraving showing the Boston Massacre and what became one of the most famous images of the American Revolution. And because of this etching, there was massive support for the Patriot cause. It was a propaganda piece. Paul Revere was also one of the leaders of the Boston Tea Party. On December 16, 1773, a number of colonists disguised themselves, mounted the ships, and dumped the tea into Boston Harbor, an event that we now call the Boston Tea Party. Paul Revere was one of only two Patriot leaders who was publicly identified as having been involved in the Boston Tea Party. Paul Revere was a courier for the Patriots, and as such, he was told to ride to Lexington to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that the British were coming. So late in the evening of April 18, 1775, he rode from Boston to Lexington to warn these men. A big part of the reason why we remember Paul Revere's ride to this day is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's famous poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. One if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. During the Revolutionary War, Revere served as a Lieutenant Colonel of Artillery in the Massachusetts Militia. Paul Revere also manufactured gunpowder and cannons for the Revolutionary War, and he actually was the first one to produce paper money for the United States. Following the war, Revere expanded his business interests and opened the country's first successful copper rolling mill, which provided the U.S. Navy a domestic source to copper bottom its ships. Revere died a wealthy man in Boston on May 10, 1818, at the age of 83. Paul Revere represents this kind of David versus Goliath kind of quality that we like to think of ourselves as being part of our national history. You've got this British force that's sent out, and it's the one guy on his horse riding at midnight who manages to defeat them. I think we really like that. Okay, so, um, and again, you can see that anytime, not only on this recording, but also on uh, YouTube. Uh, so, the thing about Paul Revere, right, Paul Revere was actually a jack of all trades, uh, meaning that he did many things. He was a silversmith, he um, had the copper, uh, the copper smithing, he also made etchings, he was a dentist, right, of course this was before you actually had dental school. Um, and so he did all of these things, and the video said he had 16, but uh, in Boston, where his house is, and you can take tours of it, they said he had 17 children. Either way, the men had a lot of kids, right? Um, and granted, he had um, two wives, not at the same time, um, but that's still a heck of a lot of kids to take care of. And um, the reason why I showed you this is that this is widely accepted, right, amongst American history that this happened. And it did happen. Um, but that's not the whole story, okay? It is true that there was a system in which um, people would signal him and he would um, stand watch on Breed's Hill, which will later be known as Bunker, Bunker Hill, on the opposite side of the harbor. And at the top of the church in Boston, they could see out to sea. Um, they had a lot of, you know, big line of sight. And so they would signal whether the British were going to um, come by sea, right, or they would invade with the troops that were in Boston. 
signal Paul Revere with lanterns in the top of the church steeple. So that part's accurate. The part that people don't mention um, is that he was not the only writer. There, William Dawes was, um, there were two other people serving that purpose on that same night. Um, they had backups, so to speak, right, in case one of them got captured, but nobody knows about William Dawes, right? And he actually made it farther than Paul Revere. The other thing that isn't mentioned is that Paul Revere was probably, he was probably drunk. Um, <laughs> because let's assume, right, this is late at night in Boston, it's really cold, and who knows how long he had been you know, doing this vigil, he, it could have been weeks that he'd been standing out there every night on his horse, right? Either way, we know he was um, extremely inebriated. Uh, so uh, that made things a little different. Now, if you see an invasion force, that'll sober you up real quick. But either way, he made his midnight ride a little loopy, okay? And so I'm going to pull up a, a graphic that I have for you. Um, and show you his route as opposed to William Dawes. And the reason for this is because Dawes never gets any credit, right? Um, in fact, people don't usually know his name. And so it's not to say that they don't appreciate what Dawes is doing, but he's not commemorated in a poem, is he? Um, now, why is that? Could be several reasons. Um, but we do know that William Dawes was not as well known as uh, Thomas Revere, as Paul Revere, I'm sorry. So that could have been why. Everybody knew who Paul Revere was. And Paul Revere, like I said, very well known, very much part of the, let's, here we go. And I'll show you that. Let me that down a little bit. Okay, so it's hard to see. Let me see if I can make it bigger. All right, so here's Boston, right? Um, here's where Paul Revere is. He takes off, goes up this way, down here. He's going over to Lexington and then to Concord, but he gets captured here. And Dawes, right here in the green, he makes it past. He goes all the way over. He's uh, almost to Concord. And turns around and goes back because he sees the capture of Paul Revere, right? And then the red arrows, of course, are uh, the British. And uh, there we go. Sorry, I thought you could see that, right? So those are the red. They go all the way over here. Uh, green here, this is Dawes, right? But nobody ever hears about him. And he's the one who didn't get captured. Go figure. All right. So here's Paul Revere going out here. And the next question, of course, is why are they going to... Lexington and Concord, because the British had stashed ammunition and weapons there. And the colonial militia knew it. So they were going to steal stuff, right? So hopefully this will kind of give you an idea of our uh, different uh, history than you may see in your average American history textbook. And that's the reason why I brought this up, right? Because history has been, um, to use a phrase, written by the victors, the people who won. And it's important that we look past, and history is doing a good job of this now, right? In the last five or 10 years, we've really delved into um, African American history, Native American history, uh, Hispanic heritage, which it's Hispanic Heritage Month uh, this month, and I'll post stuff about that. Uh, women's history, stuff like that, because if you look even at our textbook, right, um, they don't mention women very much. And they don't mention the contributions of African Americans almost at all, right? And we were all there. Why don't we see this? Because a vast amount of the information that's being put out from that time period is written by what they would consider the victors, but these are wealthy white men, right? Um, so it's important that you analyze your sources and um, figure out the bias because there is a lot of bias. Um, and we can look at the facts and history is trying to differentiate between facts and 
what people would call heritage. And this is big in the political realm right now, uh, especially when we're talking about Confederate monuments that are coming down and um, flag, you know, the Confederate flag. You see this worldwide. You see this happening um, in colonies. Barbados uh, just said they're getting rid of the queen as the head of government. Um, you saw in Colombia or Venezuela, they just tore down a statue of a conquistador. Right. So people are starting to reckon with the fact that a large part of our history is based on colonial imperialism, imperialism and written by um, the conquerors, completely neglecting uh, the other people that are that were there already and that definitely contributed to American history. OK, do you guys have any questions over the stuff we went over? I don't want to get too far ahead. Stop that. Okay, I don't see anybody uh, raising their hands or anything in there. So uh, I'm going to be adding information on Blackboard about uh, the midterm assignment over the weekend. Nobody panic, right? Um, the midterm assignment is bigger. Uh, more work than this document analysis for sure, but I don't want you guys to um, stress about it yet. Okay, we'll go over it, we'll spend time on it, I'll make instructional videos about it, we'll talk about the documents because there are several um, that you have to use in the paper, and um, I don't want to overwhelm you when we need you to just turn in this document analysis by tomorrow. Also, make sure that you have, you know, you complete your Mind Tap Chapter 5 test by. 11:59 on the 19th, which is Saturday. Yes, question. Um, is the midterm also going to be Chicago style? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. Any other questions? Okay. Go ahead and put your name in the chat if you haven't already. You don't have to do it twice. So make sure your name goes in the chat. Um, I'm going to sign off. You guys can. Um, I'm going to give you some extra time today. I know you guys are going to be so depressed about that. Um, <laughs> um, so give you a little extra time to work on that, on that work. I'm going to be in here, but I'm probably going to be on mute and the video won't be on. I will be able to hear you if you have questions because I need to copy down y'all's attendance. Um, just a side note on that. So how I take attendance is I take your names in the chat message. I also double check them against the attendance report that Blackboard creates for the session. Um, and because there's always two or three of y'all that don't put your names in the chat. So I add you on there and attendance is taken in Blackboard and also T-Claw. So if you're starting to get those attendance messages, hopefully you haven't, but if you've got them, it's from T-Claw, just means you're absent. Um, that you've been marked absent. Doesn't necessarily you know, want to induce panic there. Okay, y'all have a good weekend. Take care of yourselves, stay safe, uh, keep an eye on those hurricanes, and do good work on the essay. Oh, one other thing, I know I'm sorry, I know I told you, so I'll let you go. I wanna draw your attention to um, the weight of all these things on, um, on your syllabus. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's important that we put this into perspective, okay? What you're looking at, and hopefully this will help you to um, realize where you need to focus your um, attention on, really. Okay, so again, the syllabus is, we've gone over this, but, so your major assignment's 500 total points in the entire course. Okay, and so 150 of those are going to be those papers. So each one of the document analysis is 50 points. Okay, then you go on to um, the discussions, right? We're going to have five. We've already had two. They're going to be in the form of those polls that we do in class. Those are 20 points each. Okay? So all together, those discussions are 100 points. Um, the historical knowledge is a combination of MindTap and that plagiarism quiz. So MindTap is 100 points. The plagiarism quiz is 50, okay? But MindTap's 100 points is all 14 chapters, okay? Your midterm assignment is here. It's gonna be 50 points by itself. Your final exam will be 50 points, 
Okay, so keep that in mind. Make sure that you are, you know, dedicating enough time to those assignments that have big point values to them. Christopher. Yes, are we going to have a chance to redo the uh, plagiarism quiz? No. No, unfortunately not. Um, they, that's part of the um, assessment that SACS requires us to do. And that's the other thing um, that we really need to be mindful of is that SACS is um, who issues our accreditation for the university, right? And every so over many years, you have they do an audit and we're under that audit right now. So we need to make sure everything is squeaky clean and everything is done absolutely correctly. And that's why they want information. We have to turn in the assessment data from that and from your midterm assignment. So um, that's you know really important. If they find any kind of discrepancies um, in anything regarding, um, you know, I mean, you could just look at what happened to the president last year, uh, the president of the university, right? Um, and the issues with cheating and bribery and things of that nature. Like those are huge red flags and we do not need those, right? Um, because I have a degree from this university and I would like it to mean something. Uh, so we have to kind of keep that in mind um, that we are expected to, uh, and this is unfortunate, but as an HBCU, we are often inspected much more closely than everyone else. Okay, Leah, Addison. Did you have a question, Leah? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm just making sure you can hear me. Okay. So about the mind tap courses or the quizzes, I was wondering, would it be, would you be able to like curve the grades if possible? The tests aren't the easiest, well, at least to me. And so I was just wondering if you could add a couple points on if possible <laughs> towards the end of the semester or. Um, no, no, we can't just curve the mind tap stuff, but. Um, just remember that it's 100 points across the 14 chapters. So if you do poorly on one, you can make it up on the next. Right? And um, okay. you can, MindTap has a lot of study guide material and a lot of practice stuff. So you can mess around with that a lot. Um, and Study Hub that's on there, that's super helpful. I, um, but as far as that, not necessarily no. Um, and again, this comes from okay. the last couple of years. The department and the college have come under a lot of scrutiny about everyone has to do the same thing. Every history class at 231 has to be exactly the same. We all have to have the same syllabus. We all have to be doing the same. Work. So um, it's changing, right? Um, but I will say, again, just remember that you can always make those points in another test. And it's only 100 points across the board. That's, um, you know, compared to the other assignments where it's one assignment that's worth 100 points, right? Like that midterm assignment. If you knock that out of the park, right, you do really well on that, that's really going to help you, right? As opposed to these, like, six, seven-point okay. tests. Okay. Um, let me, sorry, am I on the wrong there? Okay. Where's my mouse? It's over here. That's why. <laughs> All right. Jillian? Yes. So for MindTap, um, so, we're, so when we complete our test, we're not going to be able to see what we made anymore. Is that is that true or no? You'll be able to see your grade. And after the due date, you may be able to see the responses. But we okay. will um, I'll have to take a look at it. Oh, um, so if, and, so go ahead. Get if we get um, like, okay, so on mind tap, like you know how we like do the um, answer the questions and stuff, and mm -hmm. afterwards they would tell you, oh, you got it wrong because of X, Y, and Z, or give you like background. So it's not going to do that at all anymore. Not until the due date has passed. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yes. 
All right. Oh, another question, Jillian? No. Oh, no, no. okay. Okay. Anybody else? Um, yeah, do we still get the same like three attempts on each chapter test that we did before? No, you only get one. Yep, only one now. Christopher? Okay, yeah, uh, I got another question about the, the syllabus test. Will there be any uh, chance to make up those 50 points or is this just lost? You mean plagiarism quiz? Yeah, 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 plagiarism quiz. Sorry. Um, there really isn't. I would um, email me and talk about specifics, like why you missed it specifically, because, um, you know, excused absences can be made up. Um, but it will, no, it will not be reopened on the class level. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll email you and I'll give you, um, do I have to send you like an excuse or anything like that? Well, just email me and give me, let me know what's going on and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Fitzroy, St. John, St. Jean? Yeah, in regards to the um, discussions, I haven't really been seeing them posted on Blackboards. And you said we, we did two already? Yeah, there are polls that we do in the class. Oh, in class. So, yeah, in class. These are in class discussions. And like the last number two, discussion two, was like five or six questions about plagiarism, right? We went through the writing samples, the student writing samples, and uh, discussed whether that was an example of plagiarism or not. Oh, okay. I thought it was like And the, the first one was, um, goodness, I can't remember what the first one was, but it was one, it was a multiple choice question. Oh, it was about the Columbian Exchange. But yeah, we do them in class. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Okay, um, I'm going to turn off the video, and like I said, I'm going to stay in here because i got to record all your attendance, but y'all are free to go. Have a great weekend. Do really well in that document analysis, <laughs> and email me if you have any more questions. Bye. Have a good weekend. Be safe. You too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.